What's good, everybody? It's your boy O'Shea Duke Jackson back at it again with another episode here on the O'Shea Duke Jackson channel. Make sure you guys like, comment, hit the bell, and subscribe if you like this content. And today we have the legendary honorable Dr. T. Son Johnson. Finally, it's been years. I've known about him, he's known about me. Probably the white man was holding me back what? Uh, from my brother. And I'm gonna let him ex- uh, introduce himself and what he does. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead, let them know what's, what's, uh, how you how, what you do. Well, first, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Um, I am uh, associate uh, uh, professor of Africana Studies at Cal State University Fresno in California. Uh, I also am the founder and lead scholar of the Institute for Black Male Studies, um, and that uh, I launched that uh, November 2020. So, yeah. Okay, so you do African African studies. And also mm-hmm. black male studies. Yes, sir. Uh, Africana studies is the, the field that I was trained in or one of them. And then, uh, you know, black male studies is a new field in the last few years that myself and a handful of scholars have been b- b- building. So Dr. Tommy Curry, uh, Dr. Ronald Neal, uh, you know, and a small number of brothers. William Smith There's just a few brothers putting it on. And uh, there's only one department in the world for black male studies. Uh, at you know, as far as having a physical location, and that's in Scotland uh, with Dr. Tommy Curry. So I developed the Institute for Black Male Studies online so that other people can be able to experience the field uh, outside of that. So there's only two two departments in the world, so to speak. So we're definitely an underserved population, and I'm, I'm glad that you and Dr. Curry, who's uh, believing you told me is in Scotland now, mm-hmm. um, I'm glad that we have academics, uh, you know, studying our issues and and also giving solutions but why why what was the what made you want to go into um black male studies and developing as a you know as a genre or as a field of study yeah it, it, you know it was one of those things that kind of snuck up on me because i did my training and i was just a kind of a generic scholar most of my interests were you know primarily african-american that's my my, my area but um you know i think i think what got me into it is I started studying, um, you know, just the family. And I was talking more so about just, you know, kind of generically how that looked. And I was noticing the students who were coming in the door uh, and I was asked to teach a black male course. So I'm teaching the course. And based on my feminist training from graduate school, I noticed that fewer and fewer brothers would take the class. And I noticed more and more women were coming in and they were they were taking the class to kind of wag their finger at black men. And I started mm-hmm. to notice the way my training impacted the students in the room. And I was like, you know, I'm doing something wrong, you know, just looking at this and looking at how even even their body posture, like the, the way my black male students were sitting in class. It was like, oh, they, they looked dejected. They looked like, you know, they were sad. They were depressed. And, and you know, and the women were just kind of coming down on them, making them responsible for all the problems in the community. And I'm helping based on the way I was trained. So mm-hmm. I started to ask some different questions and do some research and really begin to look at some of the data around black men. And I started to kind of center those brothers in class and give them the mic, give them the opportunity to speak from their experience. And I noticed a difference. And so that kind of sent me down this, this path of like, okay, what, what's going on with black men? What's going on in the field that I've been trained in? And it really just it started me on a whole different path, which eventually ran me into the black manosphere as well. You know what I mean? The same kind of questions, like what, what are black men talking about? And I ran into uh, this whole area. So, yeah. When you talk about questions, what are the questions? Because that you mentioned and about, you know, that, that, that ran you into these into, into this sphere. What are the questions that you're 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 talking about there? Well, as far as the, is what ran me into the manosphere, it was it was both academic questions and then issues and experiences I had in my own you know personal life. Right. So as far as the academic questions, it were it was questions more about like, OK, um, you know, how do black men's and women's experiences differ? Are they the same? Because that's what we were taught in graduate school, you know, in Africana studies. We were taught to look at black people as a unit. Right. All black people. And we go through th- things at, as black people. But when you account for gender, there is a space for women and girls and they can talk about their experience. But I was like, is there a space for men and boys? And nobody really had raised the question. So, I, so you know, I was kind of asking about, OK, well, you know, is, is, is incarceration different? You know, and, and we would only talk about it in, gen, in, in general terms 
So it was it wasn't as easy to get answers as I thought it would be because there wasn't a lot of readily available scholarship just on black men. And much of it was actually coming out of black feminists. Like they were writing books about black men and they were, you know, they were books where they were kind of also trying to tell us, you know, what types of masculinity we should have. So those kind of things. And as far as my personal life, it was like, you know, you know, I went through, you know, a period my, where I had a sexless marriage for about five years and then I became a widower and then I'm dating. So I'm in my you know, late 30s and 40s and I'm single in the day and in the dating market again, which I never expected to be. And it was much different than when I was in my mid 20s. So all of a sudden I'm just seeing things and I'm like, I'm noticing from woman to woman to woman to woman you know, this entitlement, the, you know, these attitudes, these expectations that were entirely unrealistic. And I've always heard them since the 80s. But when you get in your 40s, they come at you very differently. You know what I mean? In terms of that, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're dealing with a 20 something year old girl and you're in your 20s. But when you're in your 40s and you're dealing with, you know, women around your age, the expectations are very different and, 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 and very in your face. So those kind of questions brought me to the manosphere. I was like, am I the only one dealing with this? And as you know, brother, before before we really had social media, hey, what do we have? We had like the barbershop, you know what I mean? And these days, the barbershop is, is, is half barbershop, half salon. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and everybody at home. So there weren't a whole lot of spaces where black men could actually, you know, come together and, and discuss this. So, you know, when you, when you start talking about Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, now you got brothers communicating you know, first I'm experiencing all around the country and now globally where we're comparing notes and I'm mm -hmm. here it's like, oh, you know, I had a woman do this to me. I was like, wait a minute. You had that, too. I had that, you know, and then, it, and then I'm talking to scholars. Right. Mm -hmm. so I'm dealing with PhDs and we're having these conversations and there's there's a certain performance on stage. Right. Mm -hmm. There's progressive feminist kind of performance. And then you get backstage and you get a drink in them and you had a conference somewhere and you just drinking and talking. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, my ex-wife took half my stuff, you know, this, this and that. And you're just like, OK, you know, that's one thing. And then you're talking to older scholars and younger scholars and they got the same stories. You know, the women they dealt with took this. The women they dealt with used them and then slept with their friend and then, you know, left them for someone who had more money. So you're talking about hypergamy. All of these things are playing out in every sector. I meet black men, the same kind of issues. And so. When you asked me what brought me to the manosphere, that, those were the kind of questions that brought me. It was like, well, if we're all dealing with this, where are we at where we're talking about how to deal with it, how to respond to it? Um, you know, because it, it, I'm like, this guy, this got to be a discussion going somewhere, but it was just hard to find, you know? So that's what brought me to the manosphere. I go in, in, into this because, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about, you know, us being... I'm 39 and you're in your mid 40s. So, you know, we are we, we OGs. Right. And um, a lot of the guys that watch, you know, yourself and me, because obviously you have a, you know, an academic uh, perspective towards, you know, African-American life, as well as your own vantage point, obviously. Mm -hmm. But we do have a lot of brothers that watch us from 35 to 50. OK. And one of the guys that's really big right now is Kevin Samuels. Yes. By the way, it's 51 or yeah. about to be 50, yeah, 51, right? So at 51, Kevin Samuels whew, elevates, right? Like mm -hmm. celebrity. Mm -hmm. And he is talking about, you know, you said about in your mid 40s dealing with women. Yeah. There are these unrealistic expectations. I know this is not the topic that we're talking about, but let's bridge into it. Sure. What are the, this is leaving Dr. TSI PhD <laughs> out of the loop, right? So, you know, <laughs> TSI Johnson, you know, I'm already tenured. Now we're talking about, so what are the expectations that you have noticed, um, you know, since you've been in a, you know, a, a, a single man that you've been noticing from, from in your dating with, 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 with you know, with, with black, with American black women? Well, that, that was, that was, that was huge, right? Because there's a difference between pre-doctorate and post-doctorate, right? And I didn't know it. I didn't understand it, you know, because again, I was married. You know, so I wasn't even thinking about it, really. But I noticed that one women were talking to me after the doctorate that wouldn't have given me the time of day before. And some of them would tell uh -oh. me, 
Oh, some of them would tell me, tell yeah. You. Oh, yeah. 20 years ago, I wouldn't have talked to you. I was dating ballers, NBA players, and drug dealers. And it was like, okay. And these are women with master's degrees and so on. And so so I'm, I'm looking at them like they're these white collar professional, whatever. Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, you know, I, I wouldn't have dealt with you at that time. But, you know, now, you know, I'm divorced. I got a couple kids. I really want to, you know, I want to have a home. And, and, you know, I'm just looking at it like, okay, this is interesting. <laughs> You know, it's, you know, so, so once you put doctor on your name, there's a whole type of, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm balling out of control with women. It's not that I just noticed there was a group. It was like right. a subset of women that were now, you know, and I wasn't even approaching them. That was the other thing. They would approach mm-hmm. you in all kinds mm-hmm. of, you know, interesting little ways. Like I've, I've, I've even had attorneys bring me on to work on their case as a consultant. And really the only reason they brought me is because they were trying to get in my space and you know get at me in a particular kind of way. So they're using these professional channels, but they're only approaching because you know you have this this title. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I was, I really didn't anticipate that, but you know it's the same set of expectations we've heard, and you and I are roughly in the same generation, so you've heard it. You know since the '80s, right? You got to make six figures. You got to you know be six feet tall. You got to have you know you know, six pack abs. You got to you know and all these expectations and. And when I blended my personal experiences with my work in the academy, I started to actually bring those questions into my classroom. So mm-hmm. you know, Kevin talks about this because I had shared it with them in an interview. But, um, you know, I, I'd ask my students, I'd, I'd ask, you know, the I'd ask the men, how many of you have dated a girl that had an extreme list of expectations? I've never had a young man not raise his hand. Right. Mm-hmm. Women have been conditioned with this list. They have it. They pass it on to their daughters. So all of them had. And when I asked the ladies, how many of you have had men that had lists of requirements for women? Not one. I've never had one woman raise her hand and say, yeah, I had a man who had a list that required X, Y, and Z. Never. So it was always very one-sided. And then I started asking them questions about the list. And, you know, and one of the things I noticed is that even at 18, sitting in the classroom, in order for the guys to seriously date the women they're sitting next to, the expectation was that they needed to make six figures then. And you, <laughs> wait, 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 come on, Doc. <laughs> at 18 years old, living in Fresno, you have to make six figures. Now, they're still having sex. They're still dating. But somehow, if it goes, you know, as far as marriage or whatever, these ladies are telling them as early as 18, you need to be making six figures, which for most men across race, but especially black men, that doesn't happen until over 35. That takes time. Right. But it was an expectation even then. So obviously these young ladies are dating older men. And that was the other thing, right? They're dating older men with means. And then they're coming back to these 18 year old men and saying, look, you ain't even worth my time unless you can do X, Y, and Z, unless you can compete with this guy I'm dating. And we've seen this since middle school. I mean, you know, middle school, all the, all the girls, everybody wanted were dating high school dudes. Yep. And all the girls in high school, everybody wanted were dating college dudes. And all the college women, everybody wanted were dating professional men out in the world buying homes real estate and you know so it was hard as a young man to compete with all of that but i'm just noticing that the expectations have gotten bigger and bigger and they're imposing them on men you know at younger and younger ages and so that you know those kind of brought me into wanting to ask what where does this come from you know how's how did this come about and so it kind of merged my personal and academic lives let me let me kind of talk about 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 this because obviously I know from an academic perspective, there's a few things that um, in our conversation but before scheduling the show, uh, we talked about, you know, undermining the black family, right? Mm-hmm. Which is what you've, you have studied extensively. Mm-hmm. But uh, in this conversation, what is the policy that has incited the gender war? Now, and I want to say that, and I want to kind of, I know that women in, in America, um, are entitled, but I'm assuming that these young black men in your class were most likely uh, dating younger black women. Is that correct? Yeah, they were dating women roughly their age. They're, they were all either da- dating women their age or having sex with much older women, but those relationships weren't like serious. They were just mainly sexual. So those are the two that I noticed. Okay. And, the, and, and, and usually, I know that, you know, California, you know, people, it's a melting pot, but a lot of those young black men were usually was it usually dating other black women. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, OK. It, it, although I will say um, mm-hmm. living here in Fresno, you know, Fresno State is a, is a Hispanic serving institution now. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I can say that m- many of these young men now have Latina women that are after them, uh, okay. especially if they're athletes at the campus. They have, you know, they have Caucasian women after them. So, mm-hmm. you know, and because there are fewer of them in college, especially, uh, we're noticing that 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 becomes a factor that attracts women too. But it's mainly it's 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 other groups of women that are approaching them more often than not now, especially in because as far as college is concerned. The Cal State system that I'm a part of is the largest university system in the country. Mm-hmm. By the end of their first year, 70 percent of black males drop off, drop out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was just talking to a brother who's a professor in Chicago. Ninety percent drop out at his university. I was this was just yesterday. So it, it, that first year becomes crucial. And there are fewer and fewer black men in a, in a certain way, you know, the higher up you go. So mm-hmm. you have, you know, women of different groups who are competing for these young men's attention but especially if they're if they're athletes right so mm-hmm. yeah. but but the but to surmise that we know that the women that are not competing for those young black men are other black women for the most part these are uh, unless they get successful but before they get successful these are other groups of women that are competing right yeah that's what i'm tending to notice uh okay. many of the, many of the young black girls you know that i'm i'm seeing kind of have a perspective that they're they're kind of owed a good man you know they're old you know so it's 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 and i think that kevin has a way of putting it that makes me laugh he says i'm i'm gonna finish my career and i'm gonna go get a, a good black man off the good black man tree or something like that um, <laughs> and, and, and i kind of noticed that it, it and it's something that i think is really passed down it's just the kind of perspective that men uh, are not a priority and when you decide they're a priority you are owed you know an elite male so even if you're in the top three to five percent uh, that's viewed as somebody worthy of their attention. Anybody below that, it's damn near a gift that she's giving you any time or attention at all. So you got to be making six figures on just to be worthy of uh, of an interview, as it were. Um, but below mm-hmm. that, she's blessing you. That's the, that's the kind of perspective I've noticed. It's really gotten to be very kind of deeply ensconced in our relationships. So with that, we'll kind of get into... Um, the 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 presentation which is it's policy mm-hmm. undermining the gender war and mm-hmm. i would say what you would describe is what it is mm-hmm. it's a gender war mm-hmm. how has policy shaped this particular divide between african-american men and and, and and black women well i think i think the the biggest thing it, it does is it really incites a different set of expectations rooted in a different quality of life right Prior to the 1960s, when we talked about black life, uh, there were there were some differences, you know, between what black men and women went through. But it, I think it really got exacerbated after the 60s, where you started to see a serious uh, shift. Right. So if you talked about, say, if we just start with welfare. Right. For the most part, you know, many of us are familiar with the man in the house rule, uh, you know, where, you know, you if you were going to get welfare for the family, you couldn't have a man present. And they would actually send social workers to your home who would go through your closets, go through your bathrooms. They'd look for razor, men's razors, men's clothes and shoes. They would check for it. And they would even talk to neighbors to see if the neighbors would tell them if you had a man there as a woman. So, you know, this this man in the house rule is really deep in terms of how it's separated many black families and removed men from the home. And, you know, if you're if, if you're moving from the south, because that's what a lot of us did. It was a great migration after World War Two. We're moving to the urban north and the Midwest and we're looking for jobs, right? Because you can get a factory job, especially during World War II when you know white workers were drafted overseas. You can come get a factory job and a union membership, which meant that people couldn't just arbitrarily fire you because you were black if you had union membership. So the, and even though many unions were racist, it was still a big deal to be able to get that. So we moved to the so-called north uh, in extreme numbers, in waves, in fact, right? And when we got up here, uh, especially after World War II, when those soldiers came back and took their jobs, many of us didn't want to go back down south. So the birth of the ghetto uh, in in urban cities comes about from us not wanting to leave and hoping looking for opportunities because, I mean, what was waiting in the south for the most part, it was sharecropping. And we weren't trying to go back to that. So the ghetto comes about when in, in urban cities begin to push, you know, black folk into certain sections of the city that weren't you know weren't going to leave and so you could still kind of eke out a living uh if you could but for the most part people needed welfare and basically the way it was practiced is it separated men out of the home and left men to fend for themselves and this is when you start to see a a shift 
in the quality of life and in, in more of a, an extreme level between black men and women. Women had what I call a glass floor that allowed them to only go down so far and men had nothing. You just had to go out and scrape and scratch for whatever. So that was the beginning point. And, and, you, and, and with that quality, that difference of, in, in quality of life, black men and women began to actually see uh, see things very differently. Right. Black men knew they weren't going to get any support. Nobody was coming. If you were starving, if you were out of work, nobody was really coming for you. It was different, you know, for black women. So that was the beginning point. And, you know, a lot of this begins to accumulate over time. Right. It begins to accumulate over time. So we're living in an era where you have women that have seen their grandmothers as head of household, their mothers as head of their households. They're the head of their households. They're anticipating that their daughters are going to be the head of their households. These kind of ideas get passed down and they, mm -hmm. they really begin to separate our experiences. Hmm. Now that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. If we could talk about it in phases. So right. what can you get? Can you, uh, can we approximate a year mm -hmm. as or years when this first phase you just described happened? Mm -hmm. What was the approximation of the year? We can, we, we can talk about this in terms of the early sixties and mm -hmm. uh, coming in and, and through the, through the 1970s. Um, but one of the things we start to notice toward the end of the 70s and the 80s is uh, college access, right, for black women. Now, this is this is at the same time we have the war on drugs that's coming in, uh, you know, initiated by Nixon in many ways. And, and the way it impacts the black community, of course, is first uh, we lose jobs, right? We experience deindustrialization. Jobs are now going overseas. So black men, our work strategies were rarely in education because that's not where we were ever really supported. Right. Even to this day, black males are pushed into special ed at record numbers. So at that time, our, our work strategy was you may finish high school, but you don't really have to. You know, you, you, you but you do need to work. So that was our strategy to, to find work. And, and once those jobs dried up, those those blue collar factory jobs, um, you know, you had the war on drugs. You had all this. You had this influx in drugs. And that became the economy that many black men went into. But it resulted in either death or incarceration. Right. And when you talk about incarceration, when those numbers began to expand, that took black men out of many different spaces. You know, you, you were physically removed. You couldn't vote when you got out. You, you were lucky to find employment when you got out. And if you went in with a high school diploma or less, you were statistically tied to low wages for the rest of your life. So these these again, this this is where you start to see a split because now black women are going to college in mm -hmm. higher, higher numbers and they're transitioning into white collar jobs. Because, you know, really at the end of the 1960s, you had white women and second wave feminism coming in saying we need to work. Well, black women were able to ride that wave as well. And they were transitioning from domestic labor to white collar jobs. While many black men were going from blue collar work to unemployment to the drug world. And so this begins this dramatic split. And what it results in is you have black women on two tiers. You have poor black women and you have working class to middle class black women. Poor black women had welfare access, which provided them a basic floor. They weren't going to be sleeping on park benches with their with three kids. You know what I'm saying? They had a floor. They had a place they could live. They had utilities. They had food. You know, there was a basic floor that they had. If you were a man and you were homeless, you were just out. Now, working class to middle class black women had college access. So they were going to school. Right. And with going to school, especially with other groups of women who came from, you know, class backgrounds that were a little more secure, they got used to seeing and, and began to expect a certain quality of life. Right. That black men, many black men couldn't fathom. I mean, we literally have half the degrees black women have from 1976 mm -hmm. to 2018. We got half the degrees that black women have. So they were introduced, in, you know, especially during school, they were introduced to feminism. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. That's a whole mm -hmm. thing unto itself mainly through universities. And then the other thing they were introduced to was this white collar dream, right? This, this two picket fence American dream kind of idea that came through, you know, associating with these white collar, you know, middle, middle class, you know, kind of folk. This is what the university does. It introduces you to these ideas and to people who've lived that life. So mm -hmm. you have black women on those two tiers and they're, they're looking for, you know, black men that can meet this expectation that they've developed. But much of what they expect from black men is rooted in advantage that they've had that black men don't. And the, and, the, and the ridiculous part of it is many are oblivious to the fact that men don't have the same opportunities. Right. Mm -hmm. so, you know, so this becomes the split that takes place. And 
Now, we, you know, so by the time you get to the 1980s, you know, you're hearing this language quite regularly. Niggas ain't, shit. you know, um, you know, I don't need a man. I can, I'm an independent, strong black woman, you mm-hmm. know, and, and then from the 80s to the two, late 2000s or 2015, afterward, you start to hear black girl magic, you know, but this comes out of the same type of advantage that black women have grown very comfortable with. And mm-hmm. from there, there's a certain type of entitlement that I would argue that comes with that and even a, 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 a kind of solipsism, right? Which is basically, you know, they, no one else really, if you're, if you're solipsistic, basically no one else exists, but you and others like you, you start mm-hmm. to see this kind of language in black women really only talking to each other. And when it comes to black men, the only conversation that you really kind of hear is what's expected of us, but what's expected of us is rooted in their imagination and not tied to reality. Which is why Kevin is so important. You know, Kevin Samuel's show is so important because we hear call after call after call how <laughs> unrealistic these expectations are. And 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 you know, and then Kevin hits them with the data, like, okay, you you know, how is it that you want one percent of men and, and you know, and you're not bringing anything to the table that's anywhere near one percent. Mm-hmm. You notice this cognitive dissonance in most of them where they're like, you know, what do you mean? That way. <laughs> <laughs> what I exactly. mean. I'm me. I mean, I'm. I should have. I'm me. I should have a millionaire because I'm me. It's like, uh, so that's where that entitlement comes in. But you know, yeah. So, no, no. That's that's absolutely true. You know, let me let's talk about you talk about black men. We earn um half the degrees. I believe you said from mm-hmm. 1970 to 1970, yeah, 1976 to now. We got about 3.4 million degrees. Black women are more around 6.6, somewhere in there. So we literally have half the degrees they do. Are we catching up anyway? Um, I mean, it's, it's slight. I mean, there are there there is some development, um, but it, it's it, it's not about to close the gap. You know, black women at this point, and we've known this for the last five or so years, are uh, the most enrolled in higher education. Um, you know that tends to come with school loan debt but it is what it is you know mm-hmm. now black men you know are going into are still doing blue collar work they're still doing you know trade work um they're doing other kinds of things you know and we are i mean essentially we're doing it was, it's interesting when you look at it black men are doing better and worse at the same time um mm. for employed black men they're slightly making more than employed black women despite the the fewer degrees and, you know, for other black men, when you account for incarceration, we make considerably less. We're the only group of men that make less than our women. When you in, when you account for incarceration, we make about 51 cents on the dollar on white men's dollar. Uh, black women make about 63 cents. But if you don't account for incarceration, we make about 68 cents somewhere in there. Uh, 68, 69 cents on every white male dollar. So black men are a complicated group. We're doing better and worse at the same time. But we've never had the advantage of uh policy you know policy has never really you know been geared and targeted to help improve black men's status it's you know at best it's been you know it's it's helped black women right and we're seeing some of the private philanthropic stuff coming out now from goldman sachs uh visa mastercard google they're starting to invest in black women um there's been no attention brought to black men and boys and i stress boys because they're 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 really not getting any opportunities especially when you consider when Obama did try to at least raise the question with the My mm-hmm. Brother's Keeper program, feminists shut it down. They shut mm-hmm. it down. The first question they were asking, well, what about girls? And nobody wanted to look at the fact that girls were actually doing OK. It was the boys that really needed it. And now you barely hear about that program. Why do you think that feminists, despite having um, a lot of things, you know, they have a lot of things that are catered to them, black women. Why, why were they? Why do you think they wanted it to be shut down for black boys? Well, I, and I think a lot of this comes from a narrative uh, propagated in the university system, right? You know, where you had when you have you know black girls going to college in record numbers. Uh, one of the narratives they got was that they were oppressed, but uh, but they were oppressed by black men. So this is black feminists in particular, right? So they have this narrative that they they really take on from white feminists, which is that all women are oppressed by men and by patriarchy. And so they bring that narrative into the black community and say, well, you know, because we're women, we're oppressed by black patriarchy, which doesn't exist. It never has. 
There's never been a time period where black men have ruled over black women in mass. It doesn't work like that. Most of the time, when you talk to someone who's making that argument, 99% of the time, when you ask them for examples of this patriarchy, they will give you anecdotes about abuse or rape by one black male that did something to one black woman, one, one woman. But black men have never benefited from any kind of structural patriarchy. If you commit a crime, you don't get you, you don't avoid jail time because you're privileged as, as a man. It doesn't happen. Black men have never enjoyed that. But that's the accusation. And mm -hmm. so because of that accusation, the narrative that black women have even passed down to their own daughters, they pass it down intellectually and academics is that you are oppressed. You need to be liberated from black men and you need to be able to stand on your own. And so what you see is they create, you know, I would say over 90 percent of my black female students, when they work on projects or write papers, it's overwhelmingly about black women. Right. So if they develop opportunities, it's about black women. And if you go and look in Goldman Sachs, look in these other programs, what you'll find is there's a woman that's working there, a black woman who is developing resources or trying to get the institution she works for to target resources at other black women. So this is what I mean about a black female solipsism. It's it's really they're pushing against this narrative that they are oppressed, particularly by by black men. And at all costs, they need to generate resources to help black women even if their boys and men are doing worse, they mm -hmm. are oblivious to this. Mm -hmm. They are oblivious. I have seen women who don't even have daughters, who have grown sons, who are living in the park, who are addicted to drugs, and they are going out and starting black girl magic programs to help other girls. Completely oblivious, even when they have sons in their own homes. They've only learned to really see other black women, men are just kind of background noise, you know, uh, mm -hmm. even again, even when it's their own family members. But that's the reality we live in. And all of it is really coming about in response to this narrative that these women have been taught in the university and at home that they're oppressed, most particularly by black men. Uh, and then racism is somewhere in there after that. And they need to have <laughs> as many resources as possible to defend themselves and be liberated uh, and stand on their own. So this is the kind of narrative. And this is why you see it repeated over and over again. Let me ask you this. For now in 2021, mm -hmm. okay, and we, we as, as African-American men, we understand that we're not going to be able to get the Goldman Sachs help. Uh, right. No one's going to give us $10 billion. So as an academic, you know, you, you, you are, if we had a think tank, TSN Johnson's on that think tank, right? Okay. What do black men as a collective group, what are some of the things that we need to do to turn this thing around? Well, here's the thing. Uh, as I said, black men are, are doing better than anybody suspects. Like, you know, stereotypically, we're told that we're not, you know, we're not valuable. We don't have anything to bring to the table. We're trifling. We've been hearing this for decades now. But again, when you look at the numbers, black men are actually doing slightly better than anyone could anticipate. And we're not doing this in any kind of collective or organized fashion. And that's the next step of what needs to happen. I mean, we come from all different kinds of ideological, religious and political camps, and we can tend to get real serious about our camps. It, it damn near gets to be like intellectual and ideological gang banging. But we really have to get to a point where it's like, all right, look, I don't care if you're Muslim, Hebrew, Israelite, Christian, or atheist. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, conservative, uh, liberal. I don't care what your orientation is. We can agree that when we look at how black men are actually doing worse than everyone else across a number of different indexes, we have to be able to agree that we're going to have to pull together as black men for our own interests because nobody else is. When you talk about black politics like we have in this last electoral season, Many of the politics that we've talked about, we've learned to talk about, they're not politics that actually target black men, even within the black community. If you look at what happened with Ice Cube, right? Ice Cube didn't make a plan for black men. He made a plan for black America and black women via, you know, well, a number of different groups told him that he needed to have a plan specific for black women. And so to my knowledge, he began to develop that with the with the input of women. But there's never been any conversation about what needs to happen with black men because it's assumed that, that, that that's already been dealt with. I choose Ice Cube's situation to talk about this in a larger sense. In the black community, we don't target black men. 
uh, and we don't develop policy or at least push for policy for black men and boys. Nobody's doing it. Black women primarily advocate for black women. Black men advocate for who we're told to advocate for, which is this generic black. But it doesn't directly target black men, which is why I've actually developed last summer with the help of the, the brothers who watch my show, uh, of, you know, the black the black male political agenda which is a list of policy ideas that are made by black men for black men, right? FUBU style. And it's basically about the issues that pertain to us that you're not going to hear advocated from anyone else. So when you ask, what do we need to do? We need to actually start thinking about how to uplift black men and boys. We got to develop policy around it. We actually, we actually also got to organize our efforts because many brothers are doing this stuff, you know, and it's not organized, right? So you got brothers coaching, you got brothers serving as big brothers officially. You got unofficially, you got men taking on mentees, young men around them and giving them advice, giving them direction. We've seen that transition to YouTube where brothers are, are giving younger brothers insight on what to avoid in life, the mistakes they made. We just need to take it to the next level where we organize this and we bring it about in the material world on a mass scale. And we have to be able to take it to the next level because no one else is. As you said, Goldman Sachs isn't knocking on our door. So we need to actually be able to organize ourselves because it's not happening anywhere else. And it's not about to. It's really not about to. But that's why it, need, it needs to go to the next level. So taking advantage of technology. I mean, that's one of the things I like about your platform. Man, you are global. You are a brother from California who, who has people all over the world watching you and communicating with you. And you're in dialogue with them. That's precisely what I'm saying. We need to be able to take advantage of technology and actually craft a plan about how to help regardless of our orientation. If we just start with a base floor of you know, like, I'll give you an example. In the United States, by eighth grade, black boys, only 10 percent of black boys are literate by the eighth grade. Only 10 percent, about 12 percent when you talk wow. about math and science. Can we agree conservative, you know, liberal revolutionary, uh, political, atheist, whatever. Can we at least agree that our boys should be able to read in order to, to compete in life? Can we at least agree that when you talk about poverty and homelessness, black men, our numbers are tend to be much higher, you know, especially post-incarceration. Can we at least agree that black men should have a roof over their head? Can we at least agree that there should be political policies in the black community that we push for that target black men and improving their status. Can we at least agree on those base ideas? And then what do we do to start pushing for them? We got to at least start that conversation. That's the only reason I'm here on YouTube. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Let's talk about, you know, obviously you have um, your work that you're doing. I, I want to make sure. I, I, but what's the name of the institution you have? I started the Institute for Black Male Studies um, in okay. November 2020. Yeah, let's talk about let's talk about more about that and, and what the institution has to okay. offer. I appreciate that. It, it uh, basically what what I what we have there is there are classes that are available, there are webinars that are available. As a matter of fact, in, in the next couple of days, I'll be posting the newest webinar, the, the ten policies that broke up the Black American family. Uh, the, so those are there. Those are paid things that are available. If you go on to Institute for Black Male Studies dot com and you click on store, you'll see those there. But there are also free lectures, free interviews, I should say, really. Uh, that are up there for you to peruse. All that's required is your email address and you can watch interviews. I have interviews with Kevin Samuels. I have interviews with, uh, you know, various brothers who are in the in, in the academy, um, you know, a number of people. I'm trying to get that brother O'Shea Duke Jackson, but he's hard to find, you know, what? Uh, but I'm, you know, but I have a number of interviews up there uh, that, that, you know, you can take in. And, you know, and, and there are opportunities to help. There's also a merchandise section so you can pick up, you know, paraphernalia there and support the Institute that way. But it's really, you know, what I'm trying to do with black male studies is to and I, and I think I can say, you know, my brother Tommy Curry is doing something very similar. We're trying to get ideas out that undergird our actions. So when you talk about political action, political action is undergirded by theory. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so like, like if we take Black Lives Matter, right, or Black Lives Matter type activism, we've we've all heard it in the last five years. It's gone global. Right. Much of it theoretically is based on a number of different ideas. But let's just take one intersectionality. 
Intersectionality is produced by Black feminist Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989. This is a theory that Black women, you know, among other, it, it, you can explain it in a number of ways, but Black women are the most oppressed group, at least in terms of race, cl class, sex, and gender. Now, that's not true, but that's the theory. And that theory, after a couple of decades, spawned, or at least was used to help spawn a global movement. Theories undergird activity, action. Mm -hmm. We don't like to talk about it that way, but that's what it is. And so as an academic, my charge is to help develop the ideas that can undergird the act. Because if you just push for action, you're going to have a million people running around doing a million different things. If you actually coordinate the action with a certain set of worldviews, certain set of beliefs, a certain set of ideas about what should be, now you begin to push people in the same direction, right? And so that's kind of what we're doing in Black Male Studies. We're actually producing theories, concepts, and ideas and worldviews that help direct our understanding of first what black men are experiencing and second what we need to be doing right and that's what comes out of black male studies this is why when you read the man not there's so many concepts and ideas because he's trying to shift your worldview to actually looking from a vantage point of black men and looking at what black men are actually how we're actually living that's a that's a that's a paradigm shift it is an actual paradigm shift that needs to happen and if you don't have that paradigm shift, you're going to go out there and try and do things, but there's going to be no coherent structure to it. So the ideas undergird the action. And that's what many of the intellectuals and scholars try to bring to the table. Let's 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 get on the same page as far as the base ideas and then develop the strategies for what we want to do out in the world. And that's what black male studies is about. And that's why I introduced it online as an institute. Because unless you're in a college classroom, you're not going to get much of it. And because of the resistance that the academy and even black feminists have toward black male studies, you got to go to Scotland to get that, you know, either Scotland or you got to find a brother that read the man not and is applying it in his classes. That's a hit or miss kind of thing. So we're trying to uh, offer this online so that more and more people can participate in the discussion and, you know, and get these ideas that help black men. Wow, I have to buy this book, The Man Not by Dr. Tommy Curry. I never knew about this book, but I'm going to buy it right now. Okay. Um, definitely going to buy that and uh, it's buy it right now on my Kindle. Okay. And I just want to say, you know, you, you've done such a great job. Um, you're an excellent content creator here on YouTube. We definitely need you in this space. Thank what you. will people get from coming to Dr. Tia San Johnson's uh, YouTube channel if they if they come there what what kind of information are they going to be looking at getting from subscribing to you well uh, my main show is the Onyx Report and basically what I do with that is I try to apply Black Male Studies ideas to daily events to to you know phenomena media that's you know whatever's going on uh, respond to issues I, I basically take Black Male Studies as I see it and I apply it to you know a variety of issues that I think are relevant to Black men and and that way. I think, you know, I'm trying to prime black men for for how black male studies can be a benefit to them. But when you go to the Institute, we deal directly with the theories and concepts, you know, you know, more forthrightly. Right. So you come in and we actually, you know, kind of teach you the concepts. so You can actually use them in whatever environment you're in. If you're in social work, if you're in, you know, military, if, no matter where you are, you can apply these ideas in creating safe spaces for other black men and, and be able to build from there. But. As far as the YouTube channel, I try to use that to really just kind of acclimate people to how black male studies can work in the everyday world. How do you respond to current events? You know, how do you respond to the respond to these things we see in the media, these news reports that come out every day on all kinds of different things? I try to, you know, I try to just give, you know, pieces of what black male studies can do to help us in our worldview based on, you know, everyday occurrences, you know. Wow, it's been a really, really great interview. I'm really a big fan of uh, what you do. We've been meaning to get uh, Doc on here, but hopefully we can get Doc on here. Not in the hopefully. Come now, now uh, I, I got your. I'm gonna have your number now, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna run your phone bill up. So uh, I really appreciate you because uh, in a man of your talent and intellect, and I want to say this from you know, for all the brothers, you could you could do something else, right? You don't have to do what you do um, because a lot of times. You know, there isn't when people look at, uh, you know, helping black men or serving this community, you know, it's like, well, I want to I want to do something. But, I, well, I mean, I don't want to want to go broke or, 
risk getting <laughs> fired and you know dealing with brothers you know you you a lot of times as obsidian would say um you know they 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 they, they don't really care right uh sometimes you know they're Mm. Um, you know, you, you don't you don't know what you're gonna get. You know, sometimes, but it, it, a lot of as a, as an African American man, I really appreciate what you do, um, because it's because of people like you that actually care. That other a lot of black men are starting to understand. You know what? I do care about myself. You know, I, I have my own goals. I want to be my own individual. I want to be my you know be a part of this core group. Mm. And so many guys are coming in now. You know, Dr. Thunder. There's you. There's you know you know the professional black men are coming into this space. Mm. Because they've been through the same thing. A lot of times, people look at someone such as yourself, uh, or you know, other guys, and thinking that they haven't went through the same things. So Though they have, you know, there's guys who are medical doctors. They've mm-hmm. been through the same thing, mm-hmm. and uh, now they're able to, you know, be in this community. So I appreciate you for looking at our issues from an aca- uh, academic perspective. Mm. Um, you know, because a lot of times, any, any last things that you want to say? Well. Um... I think I think the work that's being done online is important, man. I think what's happening in the black manosphere has a lot of potential to go far beyond where it even is, you know, in terms of, of the of the impact. Um, I think the conversations are, are, are crucial, are needed. It's one of the reasons I'm here, because there are no other spaces I could find where I could actually do this research and, and, and really ask the questions that I want to ask and have people answer honestly. You know, there are a few other spaces you can do that. And I think uh, some of the major shifts in our culture, I think, um, are really being pushed uh, out of the manosphere. You you know, we brought up you brought up Kevin earlier on the show. I mean, man, the interviews that are taking place up there are shifting and pushing the culture. Right. The work that you're doing, the, the interaction you guys are having, these conversations are pushing the boundaries and they need to happen. But there's so many other spaces where people like like you're alluding to people might lose their careers if they speak up publicly so you know when you look at where the conversations are really being pushed um you know i'm looking at the manosphere i'm looking at the black manosphere in particular and i'm saying that's where the the potential of new dialogue can come from especially in the interest of black men and boys but on the academic side which runs parallel to the manosphere i mean we're inspired by it but it's it's but it also has its own intellectual roots um Mm -hmm. you know that uh, you know black male studies on that we're trying to push that on that side of the the table as well because there are other ideas that need to be brought into the discussion and and so i'm trying to bridge the manosphere and black male studies i'm trying to bridge those because the ideas need to cross fertilize if that makes any sense so Mm -hmm. um i think that's where things are and I'm, i'm i'm you know that's why i'm grateful to be on your show because it's an opportunity for us to further do that and i think it needs to happen you know, we, where we can bring black men together across all all kinds of different boundaries, and push for what should what the next level should be. Well, I definitely thank you for coming on, guys. Check out the first comment pinned at the top. Uh, we'll put the website or um, whatever Dr. Tison John, Johnson has given me okay. to promote the um, the institution of black male studies. Mm-hmm. Institute and, of black male studies. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And so I really thank you guys uh, for listening. And we're going to air this on prime time, uh, you know, so it, it, it'll be there. We'll hopefully make sure that, you know, Kevin ain't on. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kevin, you know, we don't right. want to mess, mess up. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for what you do. No, and, guys, make you. sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Subscribe to Dr. T.S.N. Johnson. Subscribe at the bell. Thank you so much, and have a good night. As you know, the buffoonery remains at an all-time high. I'm out. Mm-hmm.